Are there infinitely many points that are an integer distance apart? And if so, under what conditions? This question was answered by two mathematicians, Norman Anning and Paul Erdős. Their theorem starts like this. We'll fill in the complete statement later. Their proof was a little messy, but soon after, Erdős himself figured out a brilliant proof. I knew Erdős while he was alive, and he was indeed brilliant. In this video, I'll share with you his elegant proof. We'll actually go over seven questions related to integer distances. We'll start off easy and then move to harder questions. In the second half, we'll go through the beautiful proof of the anning erdős theorem. Are you ready? Let's go! We'll start with a small case. Can you find three points so that the distance between each pair is an integer? Sure! For example, each distance could be one unit. Okay, let's try four points. Can you find four points in the plane that are an integer distance apart? Yes. For example, the four points could form a rectangle. We can make the width three and the length four. What's the diagonal? By the Pythagorean theorem, it has length five. So all the distances are whole numbers. We've done three points and four points. Let's jump to 100 points. Can you find 100 points in the plane so that every distance is an integer? Think about it. Yes, we could place all 100 points on a line, like you see here. We can make the distance between consecutive points be one. Then every distance, even between far away points, is a whole number. That's the answer, but it feels too easy. For mathematicians, that's a bad thing. We believe that problems worthy of attack prove their worth by hitting back. What made this question easy? We were allowed to place all the points on the same line. What if we forbid that choice? Here's our new question. Are there 100 points in the plane, not all on the same line, so that every distance is an integer? Let's think about it. Hmm. Now the question seems to be too hard. What next? Let's follow the advice of the mathematician George Polio. He said that if you can't solve a problem, look for an easier problem, an easier related problem. Then when you solve it, go back to the harder problem. Okay, we need a problem that's easier than the current problem, but harder than the previous one. One thing that made our problem challenging was that all the distances have to be integers. What if we weaken that condition? Instead of just integers, let's allow rational numbers. Okay, here's the new question. Are there 100 points, not all on the same line, so that every distance is rational? Another reason this problem is challenging is that not all the points can be on the same line. But we can place most of the points on a single line. Let's try an extreme version of that. Here's a sequence of points. All the points are on the same line, except for one. It's a bunch of triangles stacked within each other. Let's make them right triangles, since we understand them best. What sizes should these triangles be? To answer that question, let's first look at this puzzle. Suppose we have a right triangle whose legs are 2 and x minus 1 over x, where x is a number bigger than 1. What's the hypotenuse in terms of x? You might wonder why x minus 1 over x, but we'll soon see why. We can use Pythagoras. We'll square the legs and add. Expanding gives this. Simplifying gives this. It would be nice if that final expression were a square. And it is. What's that mean? It means the hypotenuse is x plus 1 over x. That's why we started with x minus 1 over x. It makes the hypotenuse nice. Believe it or not, this right triangle was known nearly 4,000 years ago. In this clay tablet, the old Babylonians wrote a sequence of Pythagorean triples of this form. That's equivalent to our right triangle. This tablet was created 1,200 years before Pythagoras. The Babylonians were aware of the Pythagorean theorem, even if they didn't have a proof. Anyway, back to our right triangle. What can we use this triangle for? We can use it to generate lots of different triangles. We can plug in different values of x. For example, plug in 2, 3, or 4. Note that if x is an integer, 
or even just a rational number, then every side length will be rational. Also, it's nice that the left leg is always 2, so we can stack the triangles together. We get a diagram like this. I put the triangles on the coordinate plane. Note that every distance is rational. We could continue this way for 100 points or more. So now we know the answer to our question. Are there 100 points, not all on the same line, so that every distance is rational? Yes, we've actually solved a more general problem. Are there infinitely many points, not all on the same line, so that every distance is rational? The same example shows that the answer is yes. Remember that we switched to rational numbers because we wanted an easier problem. We've solved it, so now we have the courage to attack the harder problem about integers. Here's the question about integers again. Are there 100 points, not all on the same line, so that every distance is an integer? Let's start with our solution for rational numbers. Is there a way to convert these rational numbers to integers? Yes! We can multiply them all by a big number. Let's choose a multiple of 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. How about 60? OK, we've scaled every coordinate and distance by a factor of 60. We have coordinates on the bottom, but we can convert them to distances if desired. We have 7 points with integer distances. In the same way, we could extend this example to 100 points. So, we've answered the question about integers. Are there 100 points, not all on the same line, with every distance an integer? The answer is yes. In the same way, we could get a thousand or a million points. How about an infinite number of points? Are there infinitely many points, not all on the same line, so that every distance is an integer? Let's start with our infinite example for rational numbers. Is there a way to convert these rational numbers to integers? All we have to do is multiply by a big number. But which number? It needs to be a multiple of 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and on and on. But no positive number is a multiple of all those numbers. Our example seems to fail. We could try another example, but which one? Hmm. We seem to have hit a dead end. Now what? Are there infinitely many points, not all on the same line, so that every distance is an integer? What do you think? Believe it or not, the answer is no. That's the theorem of Anning and Erdős that I mentioned at the beginning. We'll state it in this form. Let S be a set of points, not all on the same line. Suppose the distance between every pair of points in S is an integer. Then S must be finite. It can't be infinite. First, a word about Anning and Erdős. Norman Anning was a professor of math at the University of Michigan. He was there for more than three decades. The anning erdős result is the one he's remembered for eight years later. Paul Erdős was a legend. He wrote over 1,500 papers, more than any other mathematician in history. He wrote papers with more than 500 people, again a record. He had so many co-authors that a fun numbering system was created. Erdős himself is said to have Erdős number zero because, well, he's Erdős. Anyone who wrote a paper with Erdős has Erdős number one. Here are three examples, but remember there are more than 500. Then you could look at the co-authors of those 500 people. For example, I never wrote a paper with Erdős, but I wrote papers with these three gentlemen, so my Erdős number is two, along with more than 6,000 other people the numbering keeps going. For example, if you and I were to write a paper together, then your Erdős number would be three or less. OK, back to the anning Erdős result. Their original proof used trigonometry. It was a little messy. A few months later, Erdős alone published a second proof. It's been praised for its ingenious simplicity. That's the proof we'll go over. First, remember the statement of the theorem. We have a set of points. Not all the points are on the same line. All the distances are integers. We'd like to show that the set is finite. How shall we start the proof? Somewhere we'll need to use the hypothesis 
that not all the points are on the same line. Let's start there. Pick two points in our set. Call them A and B. There's a unique line through them. Not all the points can be on this line. So let C be one of the points not on this line. The points A, B, and C form an actual triangle. Its sides have integer lengths. Which integers? We don't know. For now, I'll assume that each side length is 3. Why can I make this assumption? I can't really. I'm just doing so as a case study, as an example. We'll prove the theorem in this one case. Then afterward, we'll study the proof and realize that the exact lengths didn't matter. We'd get a finite bound no matter what the lengths were. Okay, we'd like to show that our set of points is finite. Let's figure out where our points can be. We'll focus on our points A and B. We've assumed the distance between them is 3. Where can the other points in the set be? At the beginning, all we know is that the points are somewhere in the entire plane. Later, we'll figure out more and more information on where the points are. Let P be another point in our set. A, B, and C were fixed starting points, but P represents any point in our set. Our goal is to show that P can only be in a finite number of places. That will show our set of points is finite. So, where can point P be located? It has to be an integer distance from A and from B. Furthermore, by the triangle inequality, the length of PA and the length of PB have to be within three units of each other. That means the difference in lengths is either 0, 1, 2, or 3. We'll look at all four cases. Here's case 0. The difference between the lengths PA and PB is 0. In other words, PA is equal to PB. In other words, P is equidistant to A and B. Which points P satisfy that condition? They're the points on this line. It's the perpendicular bisector of the segment AB. OK, that's K0. Here's the next case. The difference between the lengths PA and PB is 1. In other words, P is one unit closer to A than B, or the other way around. Which points P satisfy that condition? They're the points on this curve. It's a hyperbola. It may look like two curves, but it's one hyperbola with two branches. The use of hyperbolas turns out to be the key idea in the proof. What about the next case? The difference between the lengths PA and PB is 2. Which points P satisfy that condition? Another hyperbola. Finally, the last case. The difference between the lengths PA and PB is 3. Which points P satisfy that condition? It's this pair of rays, heading to infinity in both directions. Let's put all these cases together. The difference between the lengths PA and PB is 0, or 1, or 2, or 3. We have a line, two hyperbolas, and a pair of rays. We'll think of the line as a degenerate hyperbola. We'll think of the pair of rays as a degenerate hyperbola also. So we have four hyperbolas, two of which are degenerate. We've made good progress. At first, all we knew about the points in our set was that they were somewhere in the plane, the two-dimensional plane. But now we know that our points are on the four yellow hyperbolas, a one-dimensional set. That's still not enough information to guarantee that our set of points is finite. After all, a hyperbola has an infinite number of points, so we need more information. Where will we get it? Well, remember our starting triangle ABC? So far we looked at the side AB, but what if we focus on another side? Let's do the same thing to a second side, say AC. Where can a point P in our set be located? It has to be an integer distance from A and C. By the triangle inequality, the difference of the lengths PA and PC is at most 3, so again there are four cases. The difference of the lengths PA and PC is either 0, or 1, or 2, or 3. We get these four new hyperbolas two of which are degenerate. Each hyperbola still has an infinite number of points, so how does this help? Well, now we'll look at both diagrams at the same time. Looking at the side AB, 
we know that the points in our set are somewhere in the yellow. Looking at the side AC, we know that the points in our set are somewhere in the blue. So that means the only points in our set are where the yellow meets the blue. We have four yellow hyperbolas and four blue hyperbolas. Let's look at one pair of hyperbolas at a time. We have this yellow hyperbola and this blue hyperbola. How many points do they intersect at? It looks like these four points. Is it possible that these two hyperbolas intersect at another point, maybe off the screen? Could two other hyperbolas intersect in more than four points? The answers to these questions have been known for thousands of years. Around 200 BC, Apollonius of Perga proved that two distinct conic sections intersect in at most four points. Apollonius was a Greek geometer who went beyond Euclid and Archimedes in understanding conic sections. These days we view the Apollonian bound as a special case of a result called Bezu's theorem. I've written one form of Bezu's theorem here. The Apollonian bound is for conic sections, which are quadratic curves, whereas Bezu's theorem goes beyond quadratics. Still, for this video, Apollonius is a perfect fit. Two different hyperbolas intersect in at most four points. Super! Let's go back to our diagram with a bunch of hyperbolas. For side AB, we had these hyperbolas. There are four hyperbolas, two of which are degenerate. For side AC, we had these hyperbolas in blue. Again, four such hyperbolas, two of which are degenerate. How many intersection points do these hyperbolas have? I claim the number of intersection points is at most 4 times 4 times 4. The first 4 is the number of yellow hyperbolas, the second 4 is the number of blue hyperbolas, and the third 4 is from Apollonius. The product is 64. We have to pay a little attention to the degenerate hyperbolas, but it turns out they're fine. That means the number of intersection points is finite. So, have we proved the anning erdős theorem? Let's look at its statement again. We have points not all on the same line. Every distance is an integer. We've shown that the set of points is finite. You might object that we only prove the theorem in a special case. We assume that the starting triangle was this one. Fair enough. But suppose we started with another triangle. Say this bigger triangle with sides of length 65, 72, and 97. It looks like a right triangle, and it is. Even the Babylonians knew about this right triangle, as you see here. We'll show that our set of points is finite even for this starting triangle. Looking at side AB, we'll get a bunch of hyperbolas. I'll just draw one, but altogether we'll have 73 such hyperbolas, one more than the side length. We'll do the same for side AC. It will have 66 hyperbolas. Each yellow and blue hyperbola intersect in at most four points, like this. And so the total number of intersection points is at most 73 times 66 times 4. That's less than 20,000, a finite number. So again, we have a finite bound. No matter what our starting triangle is, we'll get a finite bound. And so we've indeed proved the anning erdős theorem. In my opinion, Erdős's proof is beautiful. His clever idea of using hyperbolas makes the proof so clear. As I mentioned at the beginning, I knew Erdős while he was alive. He was constantly working with other mathematicians, proving results with them, and asking them new questions. Ernst Strauss worked with both Albert Einstein and Paul Erdős, and Strauss had this to say about Erdős. He has remained the prince of problem solvers and the absolute monarch of problem posers. I hope you enjoy this perfectly polished proof from the prince of problem solvers. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.